On this occasion, many Christian people of America, Canada, Great Britain, and Australia are assembled in convention with New York City as the point of origin of this program. These Christian people are Jehovah's Witnesses because they are wholly devoted to Jehovah and his kingdom. Their faithfulness in declaring this gospel of the kingdom as commanded by the Lord has brought upon them a great amount of persecution at the hands of religionists. These are days of trial in which the faith of each consecrated person is put to the severe test. The Watchtower Society, engaged solely in the dissemination of the kingdom message, endeavors to aid all persons of goodwill. On this occasion, the United Convention will hear the president of the society, who speaks on the subject, Victory, Brother Rutherford. This looks like a Victory Convention, and it is. The Almighty, the Most High, is the God whose name alone is Jehovah. Those who get life everlasting must come to know and to acknowledge that indisputable fact because salvation belongeth to Jehovah. His word is right, and his works are all done in truth. All the wicked fight against Jehovah. The time is near when all living creatures will sing of Jehovah God this song. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Jesus Christ is Jehovah's right hand, executing his purposes, and he shall rule the world in truth and righteousness. John the prophet of Jehovah came announcing Jesus as the one whom God had anointed to rule the world. From Enoch to John, all the prophets in the law covenant had prophesied of the king and his kingdom. Violent opposition against John was manifested because he announced the king. Because he continued faithfully in the performance of his duty, John suffered a violent death. Jesus, the anointed king, began his work amidst violent opposition, and addressing his disciples, he said, From the days of John until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. That prophecy began to have its fulfillment upon Jesus, and thereafter Jesus the king suffered a violent death. That appeared to be a victory for the wicked one. But that victory was all a temporary. God raised Jesus the King out of death and exalted him to the highest place. Jesus informed his disciples that all of his true followers would suffer violent opposition. That prophecy has been in course of fulfillment from then until now. The kingdom is here, and again the violent attempt to take it by force. But this time... The wicked shall fail completely. Jehovah's name shall be vindicated and his king shall gain a complete victory. The apostles know that the kingdom is the great doctrine of truth. But following the days of the apostles, sincere persons lost sight of God's chief purpose. With the coming of Christ Jesus to the temple in 1918, the chief purpose of Jehovah began to be made clear. Prior to that time, even the most devout Christians believed that God's chief purpose is the salvation of men from destruction. Now his people clearly understand that the chief purpose of Jehovah is the vindication of his holy name, and that the salvation of men results only to those who are obedient to his commandments. They see that the kingdom is the all-important doctrine because it is the kingdom that will vindicate Jehovah's name, and that by the kingdom salvation and life will be given to faithful men. At the beginning, Jehovah gave his word that he would bring forth a government or kingdom that would prove his own supremacy, vindicate his name, 
and minister salvation to the obedient ones. God's word cannot fail, but will accomplish his every purpose. Jehovah's kingdom is a theocracy because the king administers it exactly in harmony with the will of the Almighty. His government is righteous and is the only hope of man's salvation. Since the day of Christ in the flesh until now, all of his faithful followers have suffered violence because of their faithless in announcing God's kingdom. The Bible emphatically states that Satan the devil is the adversary of Jehovah and the deadly enemy of men, and that Satan and his horde of wicked angels use men as instruments to oppose and violently persecute those who will faithfully support God's king and kingdom. Catholic hierarchy, Nazis, and the so-called American Legion are the chief visible enemies of God and his kingdom. Every creature that is against the kingdom is the enemy of God. All persons who faithfully serve God and the king are the targets of wicked persecution inflicted by Satan and his instruments. Who is almighty or supreme, Jehovah or Satan? That is the issue that now must be forever settled. All creation will line up for one or the other. At the final determination, all who are not on the side of God and the King shall perish. Christ Jesus is always obediently on the side of Jehovah. Because of his faithfulness, God has made Jesus Lord, King, and Savior. Those creatures who, without compromise, faithfully support the King and his kingdom are Christians. No one is a Christian unless he is for God's kingdom and Christ. Christians are those who faithfully obey the commandments of God. Everyone who directly or indirectly opposes the kingdom is the instrument of Satan, whether he realizes that fact or not. It was shortly after the flood that Satan, for the purpose of deceiving credulous men, brought into operation organized religion. And from then till now, Satan has used religion as his chief means of deceiving the people and turning them against God and his kingdom. Long ago, God warned the people that religion is a snare in which Satan catches men and destroys their prospects of life. The nation of Israel was caught in that snare and was destroyed. Religion finds no support whatsoever in the Bible. It is based upon the traditional teachings of men. For that reason, Jesus denounced religion as of the devil, and all who have failed to give heed to that warning have been caught in Satan's snare. Jehovah's Witnesses are Christians, and therefore, in obedience to God, they must shun religion. They are not fighting against any human creature because such person is a Catholic, Protestant, or Jew. They do not hate men as they are wrongfully charged, but they do hate wickedness and hypocrisy because such are against God and his kingdom and against the interests of mankind. In obedience to God's commandment, they must give testimony of the truth about Jehovah and his kingdom and why there is opposition to the truth. And this they must do that sincere persons, regardless of nationality, race, color, or religion, may learn that the only hope of man's salvation is the kingdom of God under Christ. They are therefore doing a good work, a constructive work. On the earth, there are hundreds of religious organizations or sects, and within those organizations, or under them, there are many sincere persons. There is not one religious organization, however, that supports the kingdom of God under Christ. The so-called Christian religious organizations take the lead in opposition to the kingdom of God. 
All the facts and the scriptures prove that religious organizations are on the side of God's enemy and are working great detriment to the people who are sincere. Seeing that Satan is the adversary of God and Christ, we can fully appreciate the words of the apostle that the Christian's warfare is not against human creatures, but is against Satan and his forces of wicked angels that fight against all Christians because they are for the kingdom. Therefore, we welcome the fight that's now made against us and are determined by God's grace to make no compromise with the enemy. To us, the kingdom of God is far more precious than all the things of the present life. We do not hate men, but on the contrary, gladly carry to all men the message of truth that those who seek the way of life and endless happiness may find the same. All those who are against God and his kingdom hate us. There is now a deadly conflict between Satan and Jehovah's kingdom. In the final conflict, Jehovah and his king shall be victorious. Over a long period of time, Jehovah has been preparing his royal house. He announced his purpose to set up his kingdom. Then by numerous prophetic dramas, he foretold the development thereof. He announced his purpose to take out from amongst the nations a people for his name, which people he uses as his witnesses. Since the day of Nimrod, Satan, by his instrument of religion, has bitterly opposed the development of God's organization and persecuted those who devoted themselves to God. The time has arrived when there must be a final showdown just preceding that time, Jehovah sends forth his witnesses to declare his name, to announce his kingdom, and his purpose to destroy Satan's organization, and also to sound God warning that all persons of goodwill might flee to the Lord and find refuge and salvation. God's message necessarily exposes religion as a snare and a racket. Leading religionists hate God's message, but being unable to answer the scripture proof, they seek to destroy his witnesses. They say, Jehovah's witnesses have no education or learning comparable to the wise men of the world. The answer to that is found in the Bible to which God says, God has made the wisdom of man foolishness. God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. No human creature shall glory in his presence. The message of the kingdom is God's and not man's, and its delivery does not depend upon any man's collegiate education. Furthermore, the religionists say of Jehovah's Witnesses, who are they? They have neither learning or a good reputation amongst the leading people of the world. Our answer is found in the scriptures to it that Jesus, the perfect one, was of no reputation amongst the learned religionists, and he foretold his true followers would have no good reputation amongst men of the world. That, as the religionists despised Jesus, so they would despise all of Jehovah's Witnesses. We follow our leader, Christ Jesus. Glad, glad to be in his class, obey his commandments, and joyfully bear his reproach. Further, the enemy says of Jehovah's Witnesses, why would God choose such common and ignorant ones as his witnesses? We answer, God knows who are the ones that love him. When his beloved son Jesus was born on earth, did, did God choose as his witnesses the religious Pharisees? No, but he chose shepherds who earned their bread by honest labor. When Jesus chose his twelve disciples, only one of them was a religionist, and he became a traitor and was destroyed. Paul, who was chosen to take the place of the unfaithful one, was once a religionist. But... Only after he had forsaken religion was he chosen by the Lord. This proves 
that even the religionist who is sincere may change his course and become a Christian, then have the privilege of being Jehovah's Witness. The argument of the religionists against Jehovah's Witnesses, therefore, falls flat when measured by the Lord's word. The Lord is now gathering unto himself the people of goodwill known as his other sheep. Such will form the great multitude, survive the disaster of Armageddon, and under the direction of the Lord fill the earth with a righteous people. They become the servants of the Lord, not because some man in the earth or others have a great name, but because they love righteousness and desire to serve God's king of righteousness. Jehovah's Witnesses are used now to declare the name of Almighty God and to announce his kingdom that such people of goodwill may learn the way to salvation. For knowing what would come to pass in these evil days, Jehovah long ago caused his prophet Joel to record a prophetic drama concerning his strange work and of his witnesses engaged in that work. And its fulfillment is in course of now. Instead of calling them mighty, wise, and learned, God calls those faithful witnesses locusts. And I submit that the locust has a mighty poor reputation amongst the high and mighty of this world. <laughs> if, if you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you have no need to worry about your worldly learning or worldly reputation. To you, God's approval is all important. Jehovah is now using his witnesses to carry on his strange work in the earth. And he not only likens them unto locusts, but he also calls them my great army. That army God now sends out against the religious element of Christendom and their faithful service is a torment to religious leaders. Locusts do not kill human creatures, but they do destroy the food supply. Jehovah's Witnesses do not prosecute a war against men with carnal weapons, but they do destroy the provender which the religionists have dished up for the people and which is poisonous. Therefore, the people of goodwill flee from religion because it is a deadly thing. Mark now God's description in symbol of his witnesses, his great army, which he sends amongst Christendom. He describes his witnesses as a holy nation because wholly devoted to God's kingdom. As is written, locusts have no earthly king, yet they go forth by bands. Likewise, Jehovah's Witnesses have no earthly king or leader. Christ Jesus is their king and leader. Of them, God's prophet says this, quote, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion and jaw teeth of a great lion. Their leader, Christ Jesus, is the great lion of the tribe of Judah. They follow his lead and utter his message, which bites and stings the opponent. Locusts enter into the houses and even eat the varnish off the furniture. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses enter into the houses of the people and take away the veneer of religion that has been smeared over the people to keep them in darkness. Their leader, Christ Jesus, the great lion, reduces religion to shreds, completely chewing them up. These modern-day locusts, Jehovah's Witnesses, deliver God's message and not the message of any man. The manner of their work and the effect of that message upon the religious element of Christendom is according to the will of God and is described by his prophet Joel in these words to it. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his way, and they shall not break their ranks. The so-called Christian religion claims to be God's vine and fig tree, but God's message of truth 
as the prophet says, now lay such vine and fig tree bare, and then strips Christendom of all kingdom fruits, leaves and bark, and makes clean bare the system and discloses that God has cast her away. This is corroborated by the words of Jesus to wit, who said that the kingdom interests have been taken away from religionists and delivered to his people that bring forth the fruits of the kingdom in order that his other sheep, the great multitude, may eat of the kingdom fruits. In the early days of America, Christians set up an organization and indulged in the sincere worship of Almighty God. Their successors drifted into politics, opposed God's kingdom and persecuted kingdom representatives. Now Jehovah is doing his strange work which exposes the great error that political religionists have committed. When their attention was called to such error, had the religionists then repented, turned to and served God, they might have been recovered. They have continued in their wrongful course until it's too late to recover. What is the effect upon Christendom of the message of truth now made known to the people? God's prophet Joel answers that question. The priest who call themselves the Lord's ministers now mourn because the field is wasted and their food destroyed. The racket about done. No more is the message of the religionist a comfort to the people of goodwill. So far as the spiritual food that religionists have provided is concerned, there is now a famine in the land because God has taken away his favor from them, exposed their false teachings as a fraud and a snare, even as foretold by the prophecy of Joel to wit, a famous, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine for bread or thirst for water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. Because of such famine, hearing of the word of God, because there are in Christendom many sincere Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and others who desire to hear the word of Jehovah, he sends his army, his locusts, amongst the people to tell them of the kingdom and the bounteous provision that he has made to give them salvation to life and prevent them from starving. A detailed description of this prophecy of Jehovah is published in the Watchtower, which you might do well to study. Religionist, unable to explain the sincere people, the meaning of wild distress that's now upon all the earth, and being opponents of the kingdom of God, they are forced into the position by their invisible master to abuse vilify, lie persecute, imprison, and even kill some of Jehovah's Witnesses because they tell the truth. God foretold that the leaders of Christendom would do these very things against his faithful people down on the earth, and that they might not be discouraged, his own people, he says to them regarding the opposition from the enemy, be not dismayed at their faces, they shall fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, saith the Lord, to deliver you. Locusts all sing the one same song, always in tune and always in harmony. Since the day of Pharaoh, their song has struck terror into the hearts of God's opponents. Likewise, Jehovah's Witnesses, Sing one grand song in harmony and praise to Jehovah and his king. That song today strikes terror into the hearts of those who are against God's kingdom. They howl and continue to fight against us. We expect nothing less. Let them howl and let them fight. That does not deter us in our service. We will just keep on singing while they continue to fume and fuss. We know that the king whom we serve 
shall be victorious and by his grace we shall share in his victory. Jehovah's organization is Zion and his witnesses are a part of it. They are acting strictly in obedience to his commandments in sounding the alarm just preceding Armageddon which command of God is in these words according to the prophet. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. This trumpet sound is noticed to those of good will that they might find the way to protection and salvation. Then Jehovah, by his prophet tells at the time of darkness and of gloominess, and that description exactly today fits the present conditions about Christendom. No earthly organization offers any relief because having no light kingdom of God is the only light that is enjoyed by those only who are in favor of the kingdom. Jehovah now sends forth his great army called locusts, his witnesses, likened unto a swarm of locusts, and he tells them how that message delivered by them affects Christendom in this, that it is a plague upon the religionists. That message constitutes a final warning to Christendom, and only those of goodwill toward God will heed that message and find an a way of escape. Christendom has been regarded by religious leaders as the land of plenty, and it's furnished a plenty to them too, and so they've likened it unto the Garden of Eden. The invasion of God's army of locusts into their pastures God's message, which the witnesses bear to the people, has burned up the religious pastors. And of their distress, Joel, the prophet of God, says these words, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Horses are not afraid of the enemy, neither are Jehovah's Witnesses afraid of the enemy. They fear and follow only God and his king. These witnesses run to and fro, swift as horses, and doing service to the king. During the past seven months, these servant horses in the field have increased more than 8,000 in number. These are not armed with guns, but they're armed with a kingdom message sounded forth by phonograph machines, printed books, and by voices of joy. Furthermore, describing their activity, God's prophet says, Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array, before their face the people shall be much pain, and all faces shall gather blackness. These faithful witnesses invade a community like a great army, fully organized, and that regardless of opposition against them. Their coming and their activity causes the faces of relig religious leaders to show a flush of anxiety, and immediately the religionists resort to harsh methods that they might get rid of the pesty locusts and their joyful song. Father describing the activity of God's army, the, uh, these locusts, his prophet says, they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, they shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one trust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. When they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They work harmoniously together, having but one objective, and that the advancement of the kingdom interest. Like the people of Jericho, 
The religionists hide themselves behind the political walls, but those walls do not deter the locusts who march around and right over their walls in obedience to God's commandment. Religious organizations attempt to hold their own parishioners by putting prejudice and fear into their minds, but Jehovah's Witnesses get the message to them just the same. They obey God rather than yield to the harsh demands of men, and of them Jehovah says, they shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, and they shall climb upon the houses, they shall enter into the windows like a thief. They do not loot houses, but they set up their sound machines at the door and get the message to the prisoners who are on the inside. The result is that the religionists and their allies shake and tremble and blackness settles down upon them. The result the Lord describes in these words. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The great ecclesiastical leaders, the symbolic moon and stars of religion, are holy in the dark because they have entirely lost the spirit of the Lord. It is written that it is, this is a time of distress, and it is a time of distress upon Christendom. While the kingdom message is being sounded, Jehovah says to all the people of goodwill, regardless of nationality or previous belief, quote, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be delivered. In having this message declared, Jehovah thus discloses his loving kindness toward all persons of goodwill. These are the ones that receive real benefit. The enemies of God's kingdom now denounce Jehovah's Witnesses as communist, reds, and seditionists. Their charge, of course, is maliciously fought Jehovah's Witnesses have but one mission, and that is, in obedience to Jehovah's command to announce his kingdom and thus to tell the truth to the people. The effort of Satan and his religious agents is to set all political powers against Jehovah's Witnesses. By reason of false charges made by religious leaders, the ruling element of the nation, have been prejudiced against Jehovah's Witnesses. Therefore, Jehovah declares his purpose to show all nations that he is the true and one friend of his witnesses and that the nations have been caught in the religious snare of Satan. By his prophet Joel, God says these words, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will there plead for my people. The valley of Jehoshaphat means Jehovah vindicated, therefore proving to all creation that he is right and supreme. There he will, by Christ Jesus the King, vindicate his name and also those who have faithfully served him. The battle of Jehoshaphat therefore symbolically pictures the battle of the great day of God Almighty where the issue will be finally settled showing the supremacy of Jehovah. The nations must be brought down to the battle site in order to see and be convinced that Jehovah's king and kingdom is the one hoped for men. The proclamation of the kingdom message stirs up the hatred of the religionist against Jehovah's servants and those religionists led by the hierarchy urges upon all the nations the necessity of gathering together in a conspiracy against Jehovah's Witnesses to stop their work by any means possible. Jehovah's Witnesses have never been guilty of violence or other unlawful acts against the religionists, nor have they interfered with their liberties. They have merely proclaimed God's truth, which has resulted in good to those who are of goodwill toward God, regardless of what religious organization they may have been subject to. The religionists have acted wrongfully 
and wickedly against the servants of God, and he promises to duly recompense their wrongdoing. The religious leaders tell their parishioners that Jehovah's Witnesses are a self-constituted body engaged in a selfish work which originated with man. That charge is not true. Let all reasonable persons now consider what follows, and which is quoted from the Word of God, and then determine whether it is man's message or God's message that must now be proclaimed throughout the land of Christendom. The prophet records, Jehovah has spoken. Furthermore says, my counsel shall stand. I have spoken it, I'll bring it to pass. To his faithful servants on earth, who are serving God immediately preceding Armageddon, Jehovah gives command which tells of his purpose and what will be the outcome. He says, quote, Proclaim ye this among the nations. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. This proclamation must be delivered to all nations aside from God's consecrated people. This is not a preparation for a war amongst the nations of the world. But it is for united movement of Satan's forces against all who stand for Jehovah's kingdom. For centuries, the religious element and the lies have been seeking the destruction of God's faithful witnesses. And now the time is here to settle the matter. Jehovah gives the enemy full and fair warning and a chance to show their strength. And therefore he says, quote, Prepare yourselves for war. Stir up your mighty men who think to rule the world, contrary to God's will. Organize what you call Catholic action and fascism combined, and use it to put pressure upon all public officials, political, executive, judicial, radio stations and others in opposition to the work of the kingdom message. Raise up your dictators, your totalitarian state, a monstrous modern Goliath. Call into action your yes men of the legislatures and your hireling judges who accept bribes and who do violence to Jehovah's Witnesses. Bring forth your would-be promoters of patriotism that compel little children to violate God's law. Raise the false cry against Jehovah's Witnesses that they are communist or reds. Stir up all the bitterness against those faithful servants of Jehovah, let all of your men of war come on to the battlefield of Armageddon. Let them come on and do their overt and wicked acts against God's kingdom and his witnesses. Let them boycott radio stations broadcasting the kingdom message. Influence legislative bodies to frame mischief by law against Jehovah's servants. Compel flag saluting and bowing down to men. Urge the political side of the government to imprison parents for teaching their children to obey Almighty God. Go the limit and do all in your power. Bring forth all of your equipment for war because it is near. You have been anxious for a fight and now you shall be accommodated. <laughs> Furthermore, Jehovah commands his witnesses to proclaim this message in the presence and hearing of the leaders of Christendom. To wit, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, oh, I'm strong. Otherwise, he did God says to them, cease your peaceful propaganda work of trying to convert the world with religion. Turn all of your forces into war equipment. You'll need them. Use them against God's people in his kingdom. You are weak, all of you, but let all of you say, even the weakest, I am strong to fight against those who stand for God in his kingdom. Furthermore, by his prophet, Jehovah throws down the gates of battle and says, Come on, all ye nations, line up to fight. 
overwhelcomes the battle because the time for his vindication is come and he knows that the victory will be his. For the purpose of the carnal conflict, Jehovah calls out his mighty host of heaven, which host is led by Christ Jesus the King. And concerning this, he says, quote, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Long ago, Jehovah said to Satan, that he would permit him to remain for a time, and then he would cause his great name to be declared throughout the earth, and that this declaration would be followed immediately by the exhibition of his power against Satan and all of his forces. Now the time has come to have it out with all of Satan's forces. Jehovah maneuvers the enemy as well as his own forces and assembles them at the site of battle. And that includes all the nations of the earth, because all are against Jehovah and his king, particularly the hierarchy and the American Legion. Jehovah then gives his prophet a vision of the contending forces upon the battlefield ready for war. And the prophet of God at his command records that vision in these words, quote, multitudes, Multitudes in the valley of decision, for oh, the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Mark this, that no earthly nation is omitted. They're all there, lined up against God, against all who are for Jehovah and his king. For the enemy, it is a time of darkness, for oh, there is no heavenly light for anyone except those who are devoted to Jehovah God and his king. The marginal reading in this text shows that the Valley of Jehoshaphat is the place of concision or thrashing where Jehovah thrashes the enemy to a finish and literally tires him to pieces. What's the purpose of Jehovah gathering all nations in this battle array lined up against his kingdom and his servants? He answers by his prophet Zephaniah in these words, Wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nation, that I may assemble the kingdoms in the valley of concision, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all of my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Christ Jesus leads the heavenly forces. Jehovah the great judge sits upon his throne and umpires the fight. And he gives command to begin the battle as it is written. Jehovah shall roar out of Zion, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, and the battle is on, and will follow, and will completely wreck every part of Satan's power. Zion is God's official residence, and he speaks by Christ and his other witnesses. The fact that he roars out of Zion and uttered his voice from Jerusalem shows that his organization on earth must and will henceforth deliver a roaring message by fearlessly going from house to house and giving that message to the people. The voice of Jehovah is his people. As stated by his prophet, the message of the hour is Jehovah's message. Message of the Lord rendereth recompense to his enemies. That message must be delivered by Jehovah's covenant people now on the earth. It is the message of truth that enrages the enemy and causes them to redouble their efforts to stop the witness work of the Lord. Let those who are on the side of Jehovah and his king keep always in mind that they're not going forth to fight any person because of his religion, his race or color, but that as God's faithful servants they must and will obey his commandments, therefore must deliver his message regardless of what the enemy may say or do. Jehovah's faithful people on the earth will not quail before the enemy, nor slack the hand because of persecution, regardless of all opposition. They'll continue to obey God 
rather than men. No law enacted by men will stop the testimony and song of God's faithful people now on the earth. Let the enemy take notice of this. The activities of the enemy will try every Christian's faith to the limit of endurance. Because of their faithless to God, some will be killed. But keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. In this time of great stress, and when the nations are crumbling to pieces, where will those who are of goodwill find refuge and safety? Through his prophet, the answer is given to it. Jehovah will be the refuge of his people and stronghold to them. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Contrary to this precious promise, God says concerning the religionist, particularly the hierarchy, who bow down to him, honor men, and who oppose the theocratic kingdom, they have made lies their refuge, and God will sweep away that refuge of lies. He's doing it now. If the men who rule the world in politics could only realize that religion is a subtle scheme of the devil to deceive some sincere persons and turn them away, from God's kingdom. No more would they say, as some of the big politicians have recently said, we need more religion. <laughs> if, if they would abandon religion and religious traditions and turn wholly to the Bible as their guide, they would I find the clear admonition from Jehovah to it, which I quote, Behold my servant, Christ Jesus, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the nations, and in his name shall the nations hope. God's kingdom is the sole and only hope for mankind. No doubt, there are many multitudes of sincere persons who believe that religion is essential to their welfare. If they would realize that the kingdom of God is their only hope, they would turn away from religion and give their allegiance to Christ the King. Multitudes are now forsaking religion. Greater multitudes will quickly fall in the same way. Jehovah lays the obligation upon his consecrated ones, whom he has enlightened, to now inform all who will hear of and concerning his kingdom the blessings it will bring. Never has it been so fully revealed to man that the kingdom is the all-important doctrine of the Bible. The faithful men from evil to John have faith in and hope for that kingdom. Now the people of goodwill discern its presence and blessing. Some of the reasons why the kingdom is of paramount importance are these. Christ is the king, the right and religious, a righteous ruler of the world. He is the official executive of Jehovah, the great theocrat. His kingdom will vindicate Jehovah's name and demonstrate that God can put men on earth who will be faithful and true to him. That the king and kingdom is the means of salvation of men from the disaster of Armageddon and of salvation unto life everlasting. The multitudes of sincere people who are of goodwill toward God flee from religion and take refuge under Christ his king. They need no earthly leader or king, and they have none because Christ is their king, their refuge and hope. Such persons of goodwill are rapidly getting into the ranks of those who bear witness to the kingdom and are joyfully carrying the message to the people. No distinction is made because some are Catholic and some Protestants and some of no religious persuasion. The sole test to each is this. Did you love righteousness and hate iniquity? Do you desire God's kingdom of righteousness to rule? If so, take your stand on the side of God and his king and make that fact known to men.
that good may result to others. Cruel laws and persecution will not deter those who love the king from going forward in the witness work. To them the kingdom of God is everything, and, and to God and Christ they look for salvation. False accusations will not dampen their zeal for the kingdom. It is our privilege and duty as Christians to inform all that we're not communists, reds, fascists, or Nazis, that we're not a sect, culture denomination, that we are holy and uncompromisingly for Jehovah and his kingdom and the Christ, and we're determined that regardless of all opposition, that our lives shall be spent in the interest of the kingdom. Therefore, I propose to these conventions, assembled in many parts of the earth, joined together by modern means of communication, this message of goodwill that we send to the peoples of the world who desire salvation. As lovers of righteousness, we have assembled ourselves in convention, bound together by the tie of unselfishness. Our complete devotion is to Jehovah God and Christ, his King, whom we joyfully serve without fear of earthly power. We have no earthly political aspirations. We are not communists, Nazis, or fascists, have no sympathy with such movements. We are not religious. But we believe, as God has declared, that religion is a snare of the devil in which men are unwittingly caught. We are not a sect, culture, denomination. We are Christians, acting in obedience to the Lord's command. We are engaged solely in declaring Jehovah's message of truth concerning the great theocratic government and peace. We have no fight with any human creature because of race, religion, or other conditions. We are against iniquity, and hence our fight is against the devil and his host, as stated in Ephesians 6, 12. For centuries, Jehovah God has magnified the paramount importance of his kingdom. His prophets from times of old hoped for it and laid down their lives for it. The apostles, under the direction of Christ Jesus, stressed its coming and its importance. Now the kingdom has come. Every Christian on earth must be a witness concerning the kingdom. Therefore, we are Jehovah's Witnesses. We seek no good reputation among men of this evil world, but we crave the approval of God and Christ. We have no earthly king our leader. Christ is our king, and our allegiance is to his kingdom. We refuse to bow down to man or attribute protection and salvation to any earthly power or creature or anything that that represents. Our protection and salvation is of God through Christ Jesus. At God's command, we declare his message, which is set forth in the Bible and in substance is this, that the day of final settlement of the rulership of the universe is here and that the issue will be settled at Armageddon, which is near. But all nations of the earth are rapidly assembling for that conflict, and for that reason they are now against Jehovah God and against his witnesses. That the battle of Armageddon will result in the destruction of Satan, his organization, and all of his supporters and adherents, and that Christ and his kingdom will there be entirely victorious to the glory of Jehovah God. That only the people of goodwill toward God and his kingdom will survive the disaster of Armageddon. The salvation from that disaster, and salvation to life everlasting belongeth to Jehovah. And preservation and salvation he will give only to those who will take their stand fully on the side of God and his kingdom. <coughs> The book, Salvation, will enable you to find the right way. <laughs> For your good, we request that you earnestly consider your privilege to now flee from religion 
and to take your place wholly and immovably on the side of Jehovah is King Christ Jesus. If you favor this, say aye. aye. The society this day releases for publication this book, Salvation. It is a textbook prepared for the Jonadabs, who will form the great multitude. By its use, persons of goodwill can find in the Bible what they need to know. Upon all who have agreed to do God's will, the obligation is now laid for the Lord to carry this message to the people before the battle begins. Everyone who loves God will do his duty by informing the people of the only means of salvation. Do your part, regardless of opposition. The army of Jehovah, backed up by almighty power, led by his victorious king, moves forward. Now, boldly and joyfully proclaiming the name of Jehovah and his kingdom. And as you go, have in mind these words of the faithful apostle, thanks be unto God who give us us the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The message to which you have listened will give courage to every Christian that hears or reads it. The speech has been simultaneously recorded that other thousands may avail themselves of the opportunity of hearing it reproduced. From what we have learned, it appears that the great and final showdown between religion and the kingdom is very near. As to the result, there is not the slightest doubt. Christ Jesus, the rightful ruler of the world, will certainly gain a complete victory to the vindication and glory of Jehovah. The question now before all the lovers of righteousness is this. How may we find protection from the woes of Armageddon and obtain salvation unto life everlasting? You have heard Brother Rutherford say that the new book, Salvation, is released this day. It contains the scriptural proof plainly outlining the means of protection and the way to salvation. All persons desiring righteousness will read this book with great interest and profit. The books of the society are placed in the hands of the people at less than cost of publication. To enable the initial cost to be met as far as possible, a contribution of 50 cents is taken now for what is known as the autographed edition. A limited number of volumes are here, and the ushers will supply you with copies. Tomorrow in this city, Judge Rutherford will speak on the all-absorbing question of government and peace. This ends this session of the Watchtower Worldwide Convention Brought to you direct from Manhattan Center, New York City.